Today's episode is being brought to you by Gem City Fine Foods. They are a completely gluten-free and nut-free baking facility, and their desserts are incredible. I challenge you to tell the difference between some other big box brand and the desserts that these guys make, even though they're gluten-free and even though they're nut-free, and in some cases, dairy-free, they are not flavor free moist delicious desserts delivered to your door find them at gemcityfinefoods.com why do we cook we cook for food for family and for friends we cook to bring people together Mmm, honey that looks good pardon my fork Hello and welcome to another Pardon My Fork. This is Andy. And this is Corianne. How are you doing, my love? I'm doing good. Thank you for joining me for another one back by popular, popular demand. It seems like every time I have you on the show, people respond to it very, very well. I'm starting to get a little jealous. Well, they haven't seen your beard yet. (laughs) All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, normally when you and I come on here, we brag about something that we've cooked recently. We can't exactly do that tonight because it's something that we grew instead. I love this time of year in our yard because yeah. it's fig season. And man, these figs are getting so big. Mm-hmm. This year, they're the size of small pears. Yeah, seriously. Mm-hmm. I can't believe how big they're getting. The ones that we picked today are not as big as, as some of the green ones we have on there. But man, we've got some. I mean, they're seriously going to take up the palm of my hand. You know, they're so big. And I just can't believe how good that fig tree has done. A little fun fact for you guys at home. When we first moved into this house, that fig tree was so ugly that I told Corianne, well, I'll just go ahead and hook it up to the truck. We'll yank that thing out and we'll just have a clean, nice, clear yard because I didn't think there was anything that we could do with that that fig tree. Mm -hmm. She says, no way. Mm -hmm. No, sir. You are not doing anything to that. It's going to come back. We're going to nurture it and do whatever we need to to get it back around. And uh, of course, as soon as we got the chickens, Mm -hmm. we started throwing the chicken bedding on. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, we we realized that the duck manure didn't have to be composted before we could put it on the fig tree. And so we've just started putting the duck bedding on the fig tree and it has exploded. I cannot believe how big it's gotten. It's almost as tall as the house. I never thought I'd see figs this size out of a tree in Oregon. I know figs grow really well here. We have brown turkey figs and they turn a rich, chocolatey, somewhat purple fig color. Mm -hmm. And they're like Thanos figs. Thanos figs. (laughs) Oh my God. You know, because they're wrinkly. (laughs) I love you. Thanos figs. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, they kind of have that look. I'll have to Photoshop that up now. <laughs> you mean like a big fig tree with a bunch of Thanos heads hanging off of it, ready to be plucked. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight what we did is we had some raw local honey and we cut the figs into quarters and then you drizzled the honey on it. Yeah, we have an aged balsamic vinegar that we got at the oilery. And some local goat cheese. And it is divine. Mm, it's so good. It, it's a really perfect combination of tart and sweet, mm-hmm. savory and sour. And, and we've got these great textures with the figs. I will say you either love figs or you don't. And these are fresh figs. They're not dry. It's not the whole fig Newton thing going on. Uh, and, you know, when you open a fig, it's like a flower inside out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And figs are pollinated by a wasp that lives in a symbiotic relationship with the plant and fertilizes the fig. And it's just delicious. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that the reason why figs aren't technically vegan? Yeah, I guess so. Because the wasp has to die. Yeah, yeah. Because it basically crawls inside and then that's the last place it goes. People might not eat figs after this. (laughs) I'm just saying, (laughs) you know, a little fun fact. (laughs) Well, you know, we've now covered them with goat cheese. The next thing we need is prosciutto and we're good to go. Ooh, 
Oh my gosh, yes. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I had not thought about that, but that's a good point. And, you know, I need to point out, these figs are so sweet. They really don't need the honey. They don't Mm -mm. need the balsamic. I mean, technically, we could just eat them straight up the way they are, and they're candy sweet. Oh, and I do. Sometimes when I'm leaving for work in the morning, I'll pull over by the tree and grab Mm -hmm. a couple before I drive to work. And we paired it with this fantastic little wine that we got in St. Paul, Oregon, uh, from Daystar Winery. It's called a Morvedra. And it's a Columbia Valley wine, uh, 2015, deep, bold red color. And it is delicious. And it goes very well with these figs. Yeah, the Mervedra wine is originally from Spain. And it's got a little bit more tannic flavor, but has sort of that soft red fruit. It's not a jammy wine. So it doesn't conflict with the sweetness that we get off the figs. It it complements more of the vegetal qualities. Mm-hmm. So it's bold. It's got a little bit of a smoky pepperiness to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll find Mavedra a lot in the GSM Grenache Syrah Mavedra blends. Mm-hmm. So that's a really common blend that you'll get in like a table wine. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. It's uh, it's delicious. It's a beautiful wine, and it goes so well with these figs. Yeah, I'm surprised. Super yummy. We took a gamble. We were choosing between a Merlot, a Cabernet, a Pinot Noir, and a Morvedre. That's a mouthful to say. Morvedre? Morvedre. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like Worcestershire. <laughs> so we struggle with that one. Anyway. I have to apologize to our British listeners. I know. Worcestershire. Sorry, Ian. <laughs> our good buddy Ian, a shout out to him. Loyal fan in England. Mm-hmm. And I noticed just recently finished his ugly drum smoker, by the way. So good on him. Congratulations, Ian. Yeah. Enjoy that steak. Woo woo. <laughs> uh, and by the way, if you are looking to put any kind of an ugly drum smoker together, I would be remiss without talking about Ugly Drum Smokers Texas, headed up by Stephen Powell. Got to go and check them out. Just a little sidebar there for you. Uh, what else are we eating around the little homestead, hon? The cherry plums have really come in. It's cherry plums, kale. Lettuce. I mean, the garden's just exploding right now. Yeah, almost too fast. I can't keep up with the lettuce. We can barely keep up with the kale. You've been eating kale every morning. My gastrointestinal system is very happy with my life's choices right now. (laughs) 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 And you know what? We can't get to the ducks and chickens are very happy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Anything that's gone bolted or or gone to seed uh, just goes straight to the ducks and chickens. I'll tell you, though, that kale is a really nice thing to grow year round. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that it would be such a, I don't know, versatile crop, I guess you might say. We've been using it in all kinds of stuff, though. Mm -hmm. Cooked, raw, like it doesn't matter. It's sweeter than the stuff that you buy in the store, Mm -hmm. provided it doesn't go to seed, obviously. But just good delicious. It's got a great flavor. All those people that say they hate kale, I think they need to start eating some kind of fresh kale. Going back to those cherry plums for a second, though, I'm trying to figure out what to do with them because they're they're kind of a wild crop and they're tiny. They've got a pretty sizable pit. Mm -hmm. The skin on the outside is quite pithy and quite tart. It's definitely tart. But when you pop one of those juicy little babies into your Mm -hmm. mouth, it's so good. It's sweet like a syrup inside. Mm-hmm. And we've been trying to decide what we want to do with them. Of course, I mean, you know, pop a dozen off in the morning and, and just kind of eat them. Uh, that's always a good option. Mm-hmm. But I'm just sitting here going, man, we've got three trees that are just loaded, absolutely loaded. And I'm trying to decide what we're going to do with them. Wine. We could do wine. We could do juice. Mm-hmm. We could pulp them. I don't know if we have anything that would be able to handle the pits. That's the only thing that I worry about. Well, there's equipment for that. Apple plum butter is always a really good option. Yeah, apple plum butter. We have the crab trees that are going right now. Crab apple plum butter. But the crab apples and the plums aren't going to be right. No, and the crab apples. I don't know what we're going to do with those. Not even the chickens are eating them, so I'm not sure what's going on. Well, they're not ripe yet. Yeah, but... I mean, come on. The we chickens are like little garbage disposals. <laughs> we have picky chickens. They're they're just not going to acquiesce to unripe apples. Well, I guess that's fair. But they're sure digging those plums. Yeah, we were smart. We put the chicken run under the plum tree so we don't have any mess to clean up. Yeah, that's very true. Very true. 
But I will I will put it out to the listeners. If you've got any ideas or thoughts that you have, you know, what to do with these. And don't forget, I mean, they're the size of a cherry. They're not big, mm-hmm. but they're just so sweet and juicy on the inside. Mm-hmm. I just I feel bad for letting them fall and not do anything with them. So if you're listening to this and you have some kind of a recipe or you know what to do with those, hit us up. We want to hear about it. We want to know what you're using them for. And having said that. Our topic of the day is a pretty good one. I had a chance to sit down and talk with Ava Marie Romero just for a little bit. She was the first autistic competitor at the World Food Championship, and she goes into detail about you know, what food and food sport has meant to her and and what cooking means to her. She helps out at a camp for special needs children called VIA. She's a counselor there and she does cooking classes. We talk a little bit about the importance of the cooking, the learning how to cook, um, being able to prepare your own food, what it means to just folks in general. You know, I talk a lot about and I even mention it during my talk with her how food is a universal language it doesn't stop with an adult it doesn't stop with able-bodied people it's universal with everyone and if you have the will and the want and the ability to cook having access to be able to cook your own food i think is is a very powerful thing you know seeing that end product when you're done gives you an immense amount of pride anyways i won't put words in her mouth i'll go ahead and uh, let her talk about what she's doing. So let me go ahead and cue that up now, and we'll see you on the other side. Ava, how are we today? Oh, I'm doing good. I'm actually doing great. How are you? It's good to be on the show, by the way. And I appreciate you doing it. Ava is a world food competitor, and you competed in 2018. What did you think of that experience? How did it go? Well, um, it went really well. Um, I actually became, I actually got the golden ticket in 2017, but I didn't get to go until 2018. That's where I actually competed for the dessert category and actually got to go to Alabama last year. I probably saw you because we were there last year, and the dessert category is, of course, one of my favorites. I remember meeting a lot of people. Like, I got to be next to Diane. She was my next door neighbor from uh, recipes of our daily bread, and she's one of the uh, bakers in top bakers in the uh, country. Yes, yes, it's amazing how it just draws so many different people from all over. Well, the world—that's why they call it the World Food Championships. But uh, you know, it amazes me to see who's able to make their way down there, and I'm happy mm-hmm. to report that you were you were one of the uh, golden ticket winners. That's right. I was one of the top 40, and I'm so proud to come of being the first autistic chef ever to be at World Food Championships in the nation. And I cannot believe it. I actually came a long way since then. That's what I like to hear. And I know that you work quite a bit within your own community. You uh, work as a counselor mm-hmm. and you do cooking classes and things like that. And I have to tell you, I like the idea of that. I feel like cooking can be an outlet for a lot of different people with a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of things that they're dealing with. I always say food is kind of the universal language that we all speak. Do, yeah. do you feel like that has has had I mean, obviously, it's had a positive impact on your own life, but actually, what I should ask is how you kind of got your start in cooking or how you found your love for cooking. Well, when I was 14 years old, I started cooking, learning from watching Emma Lagasse, uh, just watching this show, Emma Life. That's where I started my first love for cooking. But I actually started actually also taking for recreational cooking classes by chef mentor Terry and Dexter Ridley, you know, and they were like the big mentors in my culinary world. And then I actually uh, learned from what my aunt and my mom, and then you got to learn from different people. Mm, Nice. That's where it seems to start a lot of the time is in the home with an aunt or a mom or an uncle or a father or, you know, I hear grandparents a lot as well. And that seems to be just kind of the the foundation is like I discovered Mm -hmm. that I loved food when I was a kid. (laughs) (laughs) I like that you found a passion for it and just self-taught kind of. I actually almost went to culinary school at 15, but 
Well, it's okay. I did actually. I actually came to school and self-taught. I actually do have experience by because you just have to go where the hard knocks are. You learn from the best. All you need to do, even though you have a disability, just learn from the people. Really, when it comes to cooking, there's very little that can hold you back or hold you down because it comes down to your taste buds and you don't really need anything else. As long as you have a mouth to eat, cooking is something mm-hmm. that just about anyone can pick up. Yeah. Well, I love it, man. I love it. And you're not only going to be featured on this show, but it sounds like you are going to have an appearance on uh, a little show called Check, Please coming soon. Yeah, I'm going to be on Check, Please, Bay Area September 5th with Leslie Sobrocco. Just finished filming in January. Uh, we just taped in January. So it's about reviewing restaurants that everyday people, even um Food bloggers are welcome to be, be part of the table. We review the restaurants they like to go to, and they pick out a restaurant, and they actually, uh, they, we get to go to our own restaurant as well as the two other restaurants, and we got to, uh, I got to pick Seven Mile House spoiler alert, so, yeah. So. That's very cool. I'm very jealous. <laughs> Well, uh, are you continuing to do any cooking competitions? Do you have anything that's coming up soon? This Saturday, I'm doing the Adobo Cook-Off on Saturday with the Seven Wild House, uh, Capian Top 6. And I'm actually still working on some online entries for different sponsors like King Arthur Flower and different major sponsors as well. And I'm also in the San Mateo County here. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm going to be doing some judging for the Oregon State Fair myself. No competition yet for me this year, but uh, oh. yeah, yeah, it kind of is is sad. <laughs> I thought I'd be doing a little bit more competition. Do you find that competition, do you enjoy it? Is it something that you feel driven to do? Do you find doing the competitions therapeutic for you? It feels therapeutic because I love being around people and there's real people that put their hearts and souls into um, their plates. And it actually shows a lot of creativity on their dishes. But you have to bring your creativity because um, when a judge asks you, elevate uh, an entry or if you have to uh, do a challenge for them, you must take the challenge what they do tell you. So. You yeah. have to elevate in a different form. Do you have a style of cook or, or a particular ingredient that you prefer to use over others? I do. I I tend to follow recipes, but I try to tweak the recipe based on the ingredient, what they give me. I try to modify my recipes. I love that. That's the sign of a, a good cook, by the way, is someone that can really take that base recipe, but then put their own twist on it. Yeah. So let's say, for example, I was going to sit you down and say, I want you to cook your absolute best dish. What do you think? What's what's kind of the one dish that you feel like you really have a good handle on right now? Well, since I, it's actually, I just made a lemon tart, which was for the structure build, and it was the best judge's favorite. And they asked me to use jelly cleans last year, and it was a blood orange mar- lavender marmalade. So I had to use that as an element, and I had to incorporate it with my lemon tart. So I had to make melt it in the microwave and spread it on top on, and space it on the bottom of the crust and then put it on top. It's just this elevation is what's important. Man, that Jelly Queen stuff, by the way. Uh, are you coming back to the WFC this year? No, because I... Decided not to come this year. I want to, but because of financial reasons, I can't make it. But I will be rooting for people out there who are competing this year. I hear you about the money situation. I really do. I was asking because, you know, the Jelly Queens are having their um, Biscuits and Championship that's running from now until August 18th. You can submit your best biscuit and jam recipes to Donna at jellyqueens.com. By the way, for those of you at home, I heard about that. I heard you're having a biscuit cook off. I don't know if it's something you've looked into or not, but it sounds like you might be a shoe. I have. It's it's just a financial thing though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's here you go. (laughs) Yeah. I hear you there. 
And, and you you kind of stick with desserts, or do you go all across the board? I go both savory and sweet. I do both savory dishes as well. Do you find it important in your dishes to juxtapose the two, to have things that are savory and sweet at the same time? Yeah. Or do you feel like those kind of reside on their own? It has to be both uh, both concepts. you got to be creative or whatever the, the entries are. And I did a chili entry for the uh, Chase in America, and they liked it. It's just what they didn't make the cut. But they, I, I've done chili cook-offs before in South San Francisco, so I know what it, it feels. Yeah, I find most people say that, you know, most of the chefs that we talk to, they all have those recipes that they love where they take something that would traditionally be salty and and uh, have that depth of flavor, sometimes even spicy, uh-huh. and they'll kind of twist in that sweet component, you know. So it's a really common thing for me to hear, but it always seems to be the sign of someone that really knows what they're doing in the kitchen. Uh-huh. So let's talk a little bit about you do uh, some cooking classes. Do you do you like to incorporate cooking into your counseling? I do. I love to do both. I actually work for special needs on my day to day job. I actually been doing that since I was 16 years old. And I actually was a camper prior to that. And those kids are special sweet. I love. I actually started a culinary thing for the special needs kids with a friend who used to work at camp, and we wanted to get kids uh, on a my plate uh, um, program so they could learn to cook and eat healthy. And the kids really learn to cook for their meals for home or their families, and the kids are really engaged with their knife skills and they learn basic knife skills and to get to safety. Right. The knife skills are one of those important things that I feel like a lot of people can easily overlook. Well, I try to make sure they're safe. I try to use hand use gloves. Uh, we always put gloves in the, visit, in the hot kitchen facility. Uh, we just uh, make sure if they're sick, they just can't use the kitchen. They can't touch any food. But we try not to do that. That must have a pretty deep impact on them, though, getting in the kitchen and being able to make and, and create yeah. and, you know, see that final product. Yeah, it's the beauty of food. It's about love what you put into it. That's right. That's right. I love it, Ava. I love what you're doing. Uh, congratulations on your upcoming appearances in media. Thank you so, so much for coming on the show. Uh, I'm really glad that I was able to talk to you. And it's a it's a good message to, to get out, you know, involving anyone in cooking it is just a really quick, easy, fun way to get them engaged and thinking about their food and having fun. Mm-hmm. Can you let everybody know real quick where they can find you and what you're doing? Uh, I'm a South San Francisco-based food blogger based in the South San Francisco Bay Area, and I can be found all over social media, and they can reach out to me, and I'm available to be kind. They can message me if they need to. I'm very... Uh, a close-knit person. I'm always looking for make friends with the people. I love it. And they can reach out to you at facebook.com slash Chef Ava Marie. Correct. Spelled just like it sounds. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Hey, thank you so, so much for your time. And I am excited to see what 2019, 2020 have in store for you. 2020, yeah. That's my redemption year. I'm going to go for redemption of world food because I just got a golden ticket. This past year, I came to America and I'm going to Put it towards 2020. Nice. I love to hear that. I look forward to seeing you. Looks fine to seeing you too. Thanks so much. And there she goes. Cool conversation. I'm glad that she was able to carve out a little bit of time to talk to us. Uh, it's it's fun. It's fun getting that different perspective. And a huge congratulations to her for being the first uh, autistic chef at the World Food Championships. You know, that takes some balls. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to throw it out there. My little brother has severe autism. You know, friends and family know that, but not all of our listeners do. And it is really impressive to me that she has found a passion that gives her joy, that gives her confidence, that she feels so empowered in this field that she wants to compete. She was a camper at this camp 
Mm-hmm. And now she's a counselor and she's taken her passion for cooking that helped her and gives her a sense of accomplishment. And she's teaching it to other kids with disabilities, whether it's physical, mental, emotional disabilities, a combination of they all need to eat mm-hmm. and they all have favorite foods. And she really is trying to empower these kids to make their favorite foods, mm-hmm. to learn how to cook foods that they like, you know, Helping with an autistic sibling or or any kind of sibling with physical or mental, emotional disabilities is it's not just on the parents. It's an entire family. It it takes a village to raise a child with disabilities. And any parent of a child with autism can definitely talk about food sensitivities and texture sensitivities and how they go through phases where they will only eat certain things and then it changes and then they will only eat other things. And there's a struggle there. How do you get enough nutrition into the child so that they get all the amino acids they need while still keeping them in a space where they feel calm and comfortable and can eat and don't have a breakdown? I mean, For years, all my little brother would eat was pinto beans and green apples and cold hot dogs, (laughs) toast, scrambled eggs. Sounds like me when I was in college. I know, right? (laughs) And and it was a struggle. And I have to give credit to to my parents. Um, My father was a good cook, and that's definitely where my passion for cooking comes from. I remember he would read cookbooks on baking and uh, tried to find ways to hide nutrition into the bread. And we were really poor and he would buy these 50 pound packs of seed wheat and then we would grind our own flour and then he would stew apricots and prunes and carrots and apples. He'd cook them on the stove and puree them and he'd mix them into the bread so that there was more nutrition in the bread for my brother to eat Mm. because he would only eat toast. He wouldn't eat bread. He would only eat toast. And he wouldn't eat any of these fruits and vegetables. So we had to hide it. And I know many parents out there are trying to find ways to sneak nutrition into seemingly benign foods. Uh, So, you know, for parents out there, if you can bake bread, you can definitely sneak veggies in there. And prunes, carrots puree that down, mix it into whole wheat bread. They're getting fiber, they're getting protein, they're getting lots of vitamins and minerals. Well, especially these days when we have things like, uh, you know, we've got a couple of Vitamix blenders. Mm -hmm. And if a person has something like that, or even a a heavy duty tabletop food processor, a Cuisinart Mm -hmm. or something, shredding, processing, breaking these things down in order to mix them in, Mm -hmm. really is is not as difficult as it used to be. You're yeah. not, you know, pounding it up with two rocks. <laughs> I know, right? Well, yeah, we used to grind the flour and it was like this week-long process that I remember we'd grind the flour and then the next day they'd he'd cook down these fruits and vegetables and we'd make the sourdough starter. It was a sourdough whole wheat bread that he would make. So we'd mix that in and really get the yeast going and really get the gluten starting to develop. But it was a whole wheat dough and we'd work that dough and he'd make 10 or 12 loaves at a time because, you know, when you have an autistic child that has texture sensitivities and food sensitivities, you just cannot mess with their food. So he ate a lot of toast and that was always something that we could give him was toast with butter and he was good make plain pinto beans, but you can put a lot of nutrition into the pinto beans. So we would always cook the beans with a bone broth and that would get a lot more vitamins and minerals into him. Green apples had to peel all the skin. There was just no way around that. He wouldn't do peanut butter. He would do peanuts because they were crunchy, but no peanut butter, nothing gooey, nothing starchy, nothing sticky. Right. So as a instructor at this camp, Ava Marie probably has to overcome a lot of these difficulties with these kids. She might start out with wanting to teach them a particular dish and then having to help them work around texture. Some kids with disabilities don't want to touch things that are sticky or wet or brown Mm -hmm. or meat. You never know. I mean, they're all going to come with their own uniqueness and I just applaud her with the passion and desire and the patience and the flexibility to help kids that struggle just as she does. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's it's the wanting to give back Mm -hmm. and and do something that is so important to you Mm -hmm. or, or her that you feel like 
this made such a big impact in my life. I want to share it with other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think that that's really, really, really special. And Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm impressed to have had her on the show teaching kids, whether they have disabilities or not, about food, where it comes from, and how to produce a meal that's satisfying, that has good quality ingredients, that's good nutrition. I think that gives kids a sense of pride. You know, getting kids involved in 4-H is a really good thing for parents to do. There's gardening clubs for 4-H. There's baking clubs for 4-H. I was involved in cake decorating. I was involved in the garden club. And I lived in a really small town in Colorado, and they had a really amazing garden club that was a part of the 4-H extension network there. And so everybody had their garden plots, and I was an older kid, so I kind of helped the other kids. But everybody gets to grow something that they want to grow. The seeds are provided by the county, and you get to enter your vegetables into Mm -hmm. the county fair. And it was this mad, crazy excitement when we were preparing for fair because you meet really early in the morning, you pick your vegetables, you try to get the best ones you can, and you put them on your plates, and they have to be a certain size and a certain color, and you have to have a certain number of cucumbers or a certain number of tomatoes, or you have to have the right size leaf lettuce, whatever Mm. it was. And And so you spend all morning prepping them on trays and I have to meet certain requirements. And the kids are really, really involved in it. And if they didn't have six perfect cucumbers, maybe the leaders might have (laughs) pulled from the general fund of cucumbers so that they had enough. It was a lot Mm. of fun. And it's really exciting to come in after the judges are done and see who got a blue ribbon and all of that. And it's great. And, you know, there's also kids can enter chocolate chip cookies and they can enter banana muffins. And, you know, there's all kinds of categories that kids can get involved in and bake. And this week's episode is not really about competition so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, a little bit, but what a great way to introduce your children to to cooking competition, mm-hmm. even yourself. I mean, when you start when you start talking about the local and state and county fairs, there are competitions to enter into, and mm-hmm. that's how a lot of people get their start in food mm-hmm. competition. But a lot of times we forget they have categories for the young ones, mm-hmm. and it's a really a good way to go if you want to introduce them into that competition aspect. Mm-hmm. It's county fair season right now, mm-hmm. and a lot of my clients are telling me about their kids and they entered their pickles or their jams and jellies or their rabbits and their guinea pigs into the state fair. And they did really well. I have to say a shout out to some of the kids that I treat because they entered their rabbits and they got grand champion. Mm. They got $700 at auction for their grand champion rabbits. Wow. $700. That's as much as what one of our cheap cars you get when you're in college. <laughs> yeah. I mean, good point. they work really hard. They're very dedicated to raising these rabbits. Her little sister did guinea pigs and got first place. I think she got 350 bucks for her guinea pigs. How amazing would that be if you're 13 years old and your guinea pig wins grand champion? Oh, yeah. That's exciting. Or your rabbit or anything else. Yeah. Yeah. These are meat rabbits. So they are in that meat category. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there are Angora hair rabbits. So if if your kid just doesn't quite have an affinity for baking muffins or growing tomatoes, maybe they want to enter their prize skinny pig into the county fair. But it's yeah. something to give kids a reason to take pride in what they're doing, take pride in their work, their chores, their animals, their food, their garden. You never know. I mean, even even if you have a small patio garden or a balcony garden or a windowsill garden, there's also a category for herbs. So they could enter their herbs into the state fair. And so there's really not any limitations for you to get your kids involved in growing healthy produce that they can incorporate into meals and cooking at home. Now you got me wondering what a smoked guinea pig is going to taste like. Don't they eat those in Argentina? They eat them all over the place. That was the original intent of the guinea pig. I know. We just ruined some 12-year-old girl's life. Yeah, sorry, guys. <laughs> we uh, we did smoke a, a rabbit. And I, you know what? I'm pretty happy with how that rabbit turned out because we smoked it how long, how long did I hot smoke it for? I have to introduce this dish. Smoked rabbit tacos. Yes. This was our Taco Tuesday adventure. And, oh, and did I get any photos? No, I didn't. Sorry. 
Yeah, we ate them all really fast. I couldn't believe it. My nephew was over. We were hanging out. He was helping me man the grill. As soon as it was done, Corian was like, food. I was like, food. He inhaled two tacos before you sat down. That's a good point. That's He's good point. 18 going on empty pit of despair. Fill his stomach with tacos. At any rate, after I had eaten my second taco, I suddenly realized that I had not taken any photos. And this rabbit was beautiful. So. We're going to have to do it next week for Taco Tuesday. And oh, darn. I'll get, I'll get I'm, lots of photos. I'm going to suffer with a second round of smoked rabbit tacos. Woe is me. And it actually worked out just fine because the seasoning that I worked on it was just the the SPG brand. I think that's the brand of the rub. It Salt, says, pepper, garlic. Yeah, it says SPG on the front. It's got mm-hmm. a few other things in it, but the main ingredient is just salt, pepper, garlic. And uh, douse the rabbit down in that. It went over maple and applewood smoke. Two hours? Yeah, I want to say it was on the smoker for two hours. Uh, We throw it in the pressure pot because we wanted to get every little bit of the meat off. And we wanted it to be shredded. Mm -hmm. Because rabbit, of course, you can can cook sort of like you cook duck. You don't want it to be raw. Mm -hmm. But there's a certain level of doneness that you want it to be at. Medium. And it's it's just done. Yeah. Just. Don't overcook your rabbit. You'll hate your life's choices. Yeah. Medium rare plus. So then once we shredded the rabbit, after we pulled it out of the pressure pot, it was on 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Then um, we made the tacos with smoked cabbage slaw. Now, Mm -hmm. if you haven't heard this recipe from us before. Everybody's had to have heard this recipe by now. Take a head of cabbage, cut it in half. Once you pull your rabbit or your duck or your chicken off the smoker, it's still going. There's still lots of smoke and char flavor in there. Throw your cabbage on that for 20 minutes Mm -hmm. and take it off. You're going to get a little bit of singed edges on it. But the cabbage will be infused with a smoky char flavor. Bring it in, chop it up like you normally would for coleslaw. Then I threw in some of your mama's zucchini relish that I copied her recipe from last year. Mm -hmm. So we had zucchini relish with smoky cabbage and some carrots. We did a garlic mayo sauce on it. Mm -hmm. It was delicious. Now, my secret with all my coleslaw is celery salt. Mm-hmm. That's that's what I love. Not everybody loves the celery salt, but I always put celery salt in there. I think it complements the cabbage really, really well. So choose your own flavor mm-hmm. seasonings, but celery salt's my thing. So we had goat cheese also in there. Really, really good. Adds a nice tangy cheese flavor instead of your normal cheddar or a Mexican cheese. And I thought it was a great combo and topped it off with mango salsa. Yeah, the mango salsa was a really good addition. I didn't know how I'd go with the rabbit, but it was great because rabbit is a nice, clean protein, Mm -hmm. you know. Well, we had smoked rabbit. We had the smoked cabbage slaw with that kind of sweet and tangy sauce. Mm -hmm. And the mango had that brightness and there was red onions in it and cilantro. And it really brought the whole dish together. I'm so impressed with rabbit. Mm -hmm. They say that if you're able to have i think it's one buck and and two does then they will breed enough to keep a family of four in meat all year round it's mm-hmm. something like that mm-hmm. you know and, and it's assuming i think four days a week with meat uh eight ounce portion something like that mm-hmm. you know but it is fascinating how it's it's kind of becoming uh, a homesteader's meat again It's really popular. Mm -hmm. If anybody belongs to homesteader groups on Mm -hmm. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you'll find lots of people that have chosen to take up meat rabbits to feed their families. Yeah. And actually, I want to roll this back a little bit because we were talking about the 4-H stuff and we were talking about window gardens because Mm -hmm. you you can get involved with just, you know, your herbs that you grow. And involving this whole episode is about involving people in their food and the cooking and it doesn't really matter what their background what their ability is none of that matters we all have to eat and we all find some level of enjoyment with our food i mean don't get me wrong some people just they don't like cooking they don't want to cook they don't get it and i understand that but I have found that when you really boil it down, a lot of those people that don't like cooking, quote unquote, it's because one, their parents made crap food and two, they just don't understand the mechanics of cooking. They feel like they're not able to cook well. And so they just say, I don't like cooking, which is some kind of a subconscious code for I'm not a good cook. And so I just don't even want to think about cooking. 
And they're afraid of failing. They're afraid of wasting sure. the ingredients. And, you know, it's okay. Find something you're good at. Maybe you're good at growing the vegetables and you have a friend that's good at cooking the vegetables. Well, you know, my nephew, we've gotten him cooking a few different recipes and he's he's picking up the knack. I think it's going really well. Mm-hmm. A buddy of mine who's uh, 23 three or 24, I think. I mean, he said to me a couple of times, Hey man, give me some recipes that I can cook just in my small apartment and something that's, that's easy to make, you know, uh, carbonara of course Mm -hmm. is a really quick and easy one that I always point people to because it can pretty easily end up being a one pot or a two pot recipe, you know, depending on whether or not you want to boil the pasta at the same time that you're frying some bacon in the pot and, and doing, you know, some of that other stuff. Can I just say, it's spaghetti with bacon. How can that go wrong? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not bacon. A, not a marinara sauce, no. but a spaghetti pasta. It's bacon, eggs, cheese, and spaghetti. Mm-hmm. Nothing wrong can come from that. A little butter, a little milk. But but yeah, I mean, when you when you really look at it in as just the raw components, it's such an easy and... By the way, fast thing to make. Mm-hmm. It's really not difficult and it can be very impressive. You're talking about, you know, maybe maybe you've got a date that you've brought back to the house. I'm just going to assume it's like a third date. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say you haven't brought your first date back to your house to cook for them. But maybe you're on the third date and you're like, OK, I need to impress this person. <laughs> By the way, not to sound sexist, but the saying uh, the way to a man's heart through a stomach, it's actually the way to a woman's heart. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I, I must speak to this. Andy grew up in an Italian kitchen. Okay. His parents own an Italian restaurant and he would bake bread. He would make pizza. He would make lasagna. He'd roll the dough by hand and par bake the pizza skins before they'd go through the oven for the customers. He always smelled like fresh baked bread. He was like coming home every time I got a hug. <laughs> and you know what? I was sold. I mean, Girlfriends, go find yourself a husband that smells like fresh bread. He can bake. (laughs) Many things will go well in your relationship. So good. You know what? Maybe we need to start our own line of men's cologne. French bread, garlic bread, chocolate cake. Yeah, I think Mm -hmm. that would get many women in. I'm good with that. (laughs) We can have one that's a bacon musk. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Call Chanel. They're going out of business. Bacon's the new scent. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> hey, what? Yankee Candle has a, t- a candle that smells like a tire. So I'm sure there's a bacon candle out there, too. I tell you what, I've never understood. I mean, yeah, I, I get the whole thing with the different perfumes. But if I were still in the dating pool and a woman hugged me and she smelled like ginger snap butterscotch cookies or something like that. Mm. Yeah. No, I have no problem with that. Yeah. I should start rubbing ginger snaps on my neck to get a good makeout <laughs> session from you. <laughs> hey, that's why you bake cookies when you're trying to sell a house. You know, this episode was supposed to be about cooking with kids, not making the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Back to kids. <laughs> I, as somebody that grew up with a autistic sibling, I have to say getting him to eat different foods and different textures was a huge win for us as a family. So I would encourage family members that have an autistic person in their family or any person with disabilities, physical, mental, emotional, try to get them involved in the cooking process. Mm -hmm. You know, there was definitely a struggle when he was going through medication trials where he was having a hard time. He wanted us to unfry the egg and untoast the toast because the autism and the medication was a struggle. And I, I want to just speak to family members that are struggling with getting their autistic child or sibling to eat. Persevere. It will get better. The older mm-hmm. they get, the the more they are able to try new textures. My brother eats ranch now. He never used to do anything with sauce. The discovery of ranch was life changing. Oh, praise Jesus. He eats ranch on anything. Also, if a particular food is eaten in a cartoon, he is much more likely to eat it. Um, I will say that when Shrek was eating onions, it was a difficult time in our house because <laughs> he wanted to eat onions and he struggled, but he thought Shrek can eat onions. I'm going to eat onions. So he still eats a lot of raw onions and that's, that's a struggle. We'll have to get over that. But. <laughs> 
he has expanded what he will eat. And that's exciting. That's really good because now he'll eat salads and you can hide a lot of thing in salads when it's doused in ranch dressing. Well, that's very true. It reminds me of something that Mark Conway, Chef Mark Conway, told me here a while back, getting his kids to eat more vegetables Mm -hmm. was just a matter of having them grow them. Yeah. I don't think he had a a big space for a garden. I think he had a little garden box. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he made a game of it every single day. They would go out Mm -hmm. and they would see what was coming up. As a matter of fact, I think he told me that they would like measure the stock of the carrot that Mm -hmm. was growing out of the ground, Mm -hmm. you know, and and just kind of making it a fun game. And then you reach that point where it's ready to pull out of the ground Mm -hmm. and you pull it and it's this this thing. And and they're like, wow, look at that. We made it. Mm -hmm. We were the ones that were doing all of this stuff. We watered it and we fed it. And and it's like uh, it's like a pet that you get to eat. (laughs) Yeah. We're back to guinea pigs. (laughs) Yeah, you know, teaching kids that carrots do not just come in that bag and they're the little bitty baby carrots and Mm -hmm. that food comes from the ground and you can have an active role in producing it is important. And it's not just important for kids. It's not just important for, for people with disabilities. Everybody should have an understanding of where their food comes from, how it's prepared, and, you know, how to have a role in that. Well, yeah, I was about to say it's not really even a hippie thing anymore because when you really stop and think about it, kids should know where their food's coming from. Yes. The good, the bad, the dirty, the ugly. Get some dirt therapy and grow some lettuce. Yeah. Yeah. If your kid turns vegetarian for a little while because they went and saw what happens in a dairy, like, you Mm. know, I don't. I'm sorry. I I don't subscribe to the vegetarian life, but, um, hey, you you know, know, some people have that proclivity. I think that I'm not we, saying it's super likely. I'm just, you know, I'm just saying. I think we've Corey lost. giving me this look like, what are you talking about? Why, why are we going to the dairy track? I don't know. I think it's it's just important. We've lost touch with where our food comes from. Yeah. And we've lost that honor and respect for the process of producing our own food. Whether it's milking the cow and making the cheese, whether it's growing the vegetables and harvesting them and producing a quality dish, it's important for kids to understand that whole process or else they just take things for granted and maybe they don't know or they don't understand or they've never tried it and so they automatically assume it's bad. And helping kids to break out of that cycle, I think is important. And adults as well. We've all met picky adults where they just don't want to eat certain things, but they've never tried it. I think your father's one of them. Ouch. Hey, now. (laughs) I will give you that way for a while. This is true. This is true. And then I helped you see the light. Yes. Yes, you did. You expanded my horizons. Actually, the uh, concussions expanded my horizons, (laughs) but uh, (laughs) You you swooped on in to make sure that I was eating the right thing. <laughs> Should I thank your concussion for your like of of cilantro now? Mm, probably not. No, let's not go there. Because I don't want parsley now. No. <laughs> Parsley's out, cilantro's in. There we go. <laughs> I can roll with that. That's fine. Listen, this is the reason why I always say, like, I need your palate when I'm working on this stuff. Yeah, this is true. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're not allowed to have any more concussions. You've hit your quota. Meh, nah, fair enough. <laughs> well... I got to be honest, talking to Ava Marie was not something that I was really anticipating a week ago, Mm -hmm. but I'm so, so glad that I was able to do it because this is a discussion that I don't mind having and I think that we should have once in a while. And I I really appreciate uh, her doing it. And I appreciate you being here to give your take on it, Corianne. Well, I have to say being involved in the 4-H and being involved in that garden club was a really impactful time in my life because, you know, we were really poor, but there were kids that were in that club that were poorer than we are. And I grew up gardening and they never did. And so it was really exciting to share something that seemed second nature to me with kids that just had lived in communities where they didn't have access to their own soil to grow their own food. And so they got to learn about where their food comes from and the party at the end of the year, this big harvest party where everybody gets together with their families and we cook what we grew. Mm -hmm. It was an awesome experience. It was a great community building experience. And I would encourage families to go out and find the community gardens in their area and get involved. Find the 4-H groups in your area and get involved. Yeah. And you don't have to live in a country town to do 4-H. You can do cooking, baking, cake decorating, small Small gardens, those are a lot of fun. Flower arrangements, those are all part of 4-H. And, you know, even if you 
buy vegetables and fruit in bulk and make jams and jellies, you can still submit those to 4-H. And kids can be involved in that and they can take pride in that. And that's something that will impact them for the rest of their life. I'm in my mid-30s and I'm talking about that now. And that's something that happened 20 years ago. Yeah. It made a big difference to me. And it's still something I take joy in. So I just encourage other people to do that and get kids with disabilities involved in cooking and gardening. You'd be surprised how it would impact them and how their behaviors might be better, their food sensitivities might be better, Mm -hmm. how they might find some kind of joy or connection in the gardening, harvesting, and cooking process. I think the one thing that we have not been able to grow successfully just yet is the perfect gluten-free dessert. Yeah, I want a chocolate tort tree. A chocolate tort tree, a pumpkin spice cheesecake bush. Yes, yes, those need to be invented. A vegan chocolate cupcake vine, something like that. Oh, amen. (laughs) That is some GMO I'd get behind. Unfortunately, we're not able to grow those ourselves just yet. But fortunately, you don't have to with the help of Gem City Fine Foods. Gem City Fine Foods is producing the most incredible gluten-free, nut-free, and in some cases, even dairy-free and soy-free desserts. You have never had anything like this before. If you have any food allergies at all, you've got to go and check them out. They've got a full lineup that caters to all of the major food allergies. Their facility is a dedicated gluten-free and nut-free They use all clean ingredients, things like cage-free eggs and RSGH-free dairy. I have never been so impressed with a dessert in my life. Not nearly as impressed as I am with Gem City Fine Foods. These guys just know what they're doing, and they can hook it up. If you want to throw a party for a gluten-free child, but you don't want them to have like their own little, you know, special cake on the side while everybody else has the big sheet cake that you get from Walmart. You can you can literally just get these cakes from Gem City Fine Foods and no one is going to know the difference. You know what they're going to know? They're going to be eating it and they're going to be like, why is this so much better than any of those sheet cakes that we get from the big box stores? Because it came from Gem City Fine Food and it is being made with love and care and tenderness, I assume. <laughs> they, they <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm making an educated assumption here. OK, their cheesecake is divine. I will just say that for sure. If you have a child that has a food allergy, a food sensitivity, or maybe it's a texture issue, I would encourage you to go onto Amazon and check out Gem City Fine Foods for your children that have food allergies. And that's a very prominent thing that parents of children with disabilities have to face Mm -hmm. is food sensitivities because there's certain food allergies that directly contribute to behavioral problems because a kid feels like crap. That's right. That's what I'm talking about. So you guys break free from the limits of your food allergy with Gem City Fine Foods. Like Corianne said, go on Amazon today and check them out or head on over to GemCityFineFoods.com. They will drop ship it to your door. Corianne, thank you so much for being here. I want to just tell you that I could not have done this episode without you. It's been my pleasure. I'm happy that I can share some of my experiences, and I'm really glad we got to talk to Ava Marie today. Me too. Me too. I cannot thank her enough for coming on. I want to thank you guys for tuning in. I want to thank you for telling a friend. I tell you what, if you are on either of our social media pages on Instagram or on Facebook, they're both going to be at pardon my fork. Go ahead and drop us a line. Let us know if you have tried the smoked cabbage trick yet. And also let us know how hungry you get when you listen to these episodes, because when I'm editing them, my mouth is just I'm salivating from beginning to end. I cannot help myself. We just talk about the most delicious stuff going on here. And unfortunately, no photos of the rabbit tacos, but we do have some photos of this uh, amazing fig dish that we made tonight. So make sure you go over to the Facebook or the Instagram. Again, it's at pardon my fork. Check those photos out. Let us know what you think. And one more time, I want to thank our fine sponsors at Gem City Fine Foods. They're bringing this episode to you, so make sure that you go and check them out. Uh, Once again, Corianne, thanks so much. And for Corianne, this is Andy, and we will see you next time. Mm